Consett is a small town of over 27,000 people and lies 14 miles from Durham, 15 from Newcastle and sits high on the edge of the Pennines. In the far north are the Cheviots and to the west it is bounded by the heather-clad hills. If you were to return to 1980, or as far back as 140 years ago, you would have witnessed a far different landscape than can be found today. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the Derwent Valley was an industrial centre and Consett was at its heart. It was the meeting of two men in a spa in the small village of Shotley Bridge in 1839 that would put Consett on the map and for over a century create an iron and steelworks that would dominate the area. When Mr Richardson met Mr Nicholson, a local minerals expert, while taking the waters at Shotley Spa, they decided to explore the district for deposits of valuable minerals. Their findings of coking coal and black band iron ore, and with limestone nearby, encouraged them to form an iron making company. In 1840, a company was formed under the title of the Derwent Iron Company. The company was promoted by Mr Jonathan Richardson and a small group of entrepreneurs. At this time, Consett was a village with a population of fewer than 150. It would soon become a boom town. From the collieries, black rich seams, see pitmen hewing night and day. The billet mill, the blast furnace, the works with us in every way. The brick works making furnished shapes, engine sheds and pipe making plants, to the stores and the engine sheds, as the furnace. Metal sparks dance We make the steel Bridges and towers Got to believe What we achieve We make the steel Bridges and towers Got to believe What we achieve We make the steel The company changed its name a few times um, and it also owned some of the uh, collieries and other ancillary works and industries that fed the works. People just associate the area with the iron and steel industry, but you've got to remember that there were other industries here prior to that. Um, paper mills, sword makers, lead mines, mining industry. Yeah, I do think there is a rich and proud industry here and a rich and proud people. The Mining kept growing for quite a while because one of the things that they had around here, of course, was coking coal. Uh, there was the, the, the coal that was made, made into coke, and uh, which they used to making steel, you know, and uh, that was uh, a, one of the reasons why the Constein Company owned the mines, was the, the, the coal that it was produced was, uh, was very necessary for being involved in the making of the, of the steel. A friend of mine whose father was a miner, and I said, I've got very clear recollections of going to his house um, and climbing up the stairs because he lived on the top flat. And on a number of occasions, I saw his father sat in a bath and his face was filthy, absolutely black. And I got the shock at seeing him, and, uh, but it was Billy's dad, and Billy's dad had been down the mine, and that's how he came home. Uh, and so all these years later, I can still picture Billy's dad sitting in his bath. Absolutely filthy face. <laughs> we make the steel, bridges and towers. Got to believe what we achieve. We make the steel. We make the steel. The introduction and success of mining and the iron and steel works in concert saw an increasing need of other amenities to cope with the huge numbers of people that now lived in the area. This led to numerous public buildings, streets and business premises springing up all around. 
As with all flourishing communities, there's a need for education and religion. From as early as 1840, when the company built educational buildings for its workers' families, and for many years later, all the schools were built by local industry. Following schools, churches were soon built, some with financial support of employees from the steelworks. And what was once a bleak hilltop soon grew into a large and flourishing centre. I mean, you could go, you could spend hours in concerts, you know, and you could on a night time when the shops were closed. You could go walk to concert and go around all the shops, you know, um, we used to say window shopping, because you could imagine if you had the money what you were going to buy, <laughs> which, as I say, you know, you'd think, oh, if I had this, I'd buy that, and you know, but uh, those were... Those were the days, you know. I think the the camaraderie between people, you know, everybody knew everybody else. You know, everybody spoke to everybody. You knew everybody in the street. You knew all about them. You know, everybody was friendly. And um, everybody, well, you, they were good neighbours. If you weren't well or that, everybody, you know, looked on them looked out for everybody else. You just knew everybody. We used to have beetle drives and all this sort of thing and it was very, very friendly. You would just pop into a neighbour's house and you can you lend us a cup it was, can you lend us a cup of sugar or can you this or can you that and people just used to pop into each other's houses, you know. The Derwent was a big focal point for kids around here though they had used to have a fantastic boat house with boat races on but uh, we, we learned to swim in there, learned to tickle trout. You'd come out covered in leeches, but never mind. You couldn't get dried near the fire if you didn't go and hunt your stacks, as they call it then days. And you had to go up in the wood, snap branches and trees, you know, anything at all you could get and drag them all down, pile it at the side of the fire, then you could come and get dried and get warm, you know. And they'd send you up the, up the fields to get taties, and you had to scoop taties out of your hand, fetch them down. And they used to rake the cinders out and put the taties in there and take them out and they were thick black. <laughs> he used to snap them open and oh, look, it was as hard as the hogs of hell inside, you know. But you let them. You let them. It was nothing unusual for the, the local men to join. We used to have a game of what you call street cricket. And you'd have a couple of dustbins and an old bat, and then all the men would come out and play with the kids as well tree swings, tree houses, anywhere you could get away from your parents. As my mother used to say, as long as there's a gang of you, I'm not worried. Mm. But we did, tops and whips, skippy, bikes if you were really not lucky and could get a, a bone shaker, mm. really lucky, second-hand bike. Bonfires on bonfire night. Mm -hmm. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. It yeah. really, really was. Mm -hmm. Knocky nine doors. Oh, God, I'm oh, yeah. <laughs> We had always had a big garden, so we had rhubarb. So we'd sit on the coal house roof with a bag of sugar and dip. This, this was a treat. You used to dip, you peel the rhubarb and dip. And you used to share. There would maybe be ten of you sitting on the coal house roof and you, you just had one bag of sugar. But you would sit, you know, and it was more, I don't know, like kids are always bored now. We were never bored. We're never bored. We didn't want to come in on a night. You know, sit and make daisy chains out of all the daisies. And, um, you know, we'd be princesses with our daisy chains on our heads. 